Hey, this video is a live video from the HVACR training symposium put on in Claremont, Florida in 2020 at our offices at Kalos. And this video is with my good friend Jim Bergman. He's talking about the MeasureQuick app, which is a revolutionary diagnostics app that, that connects with a bunch of different Bluetooth connected tools and helps technicians really make good diagnosis as well as learn about how the equipment is running in a just-in-time fashion. So it's not just a matter of giving the answer, but also instructing the technician as to why that is the answer, especially on the refrigerant diagnosis side. So hope you enjoy. Jim is one of the best educators out there. The video quality isn't great. We had a lot of issues with the video and audio. This was a live video that we did on Facebook. So there might be a little choppiness, uh, but Jim was kind enough to share the slides. So I hope you enjoy. Education for field service. It's actually designed all around field service. It's uh, sort of like a diagnostic scan tool that does performance testing for your car, right? I mean, you think about uh, the OBD2 port, you know, we got all the sensors built in. MeasureQuick does that same thing, except we're field deploying the sensors. It leverages Bluetooth and Wi-Fi tools for a variety of manufacturers, and uh, we can do some things that uh, really nobody's ever done before. The big thing is it walks the user through a process. MeasureQuick is very process focused, and that's what I want to cover today is how to use MeasureQuick. A lot of guys that have it on their phone, they started using it, they aren't following the process that we've designed in there to really make sure that it assists you with the completion, that you find the problems, you can document the results right, and we look at the entire system. Measure Quick just isn't a uh, appliance fixation tool, like we're not looking at just the condensing unit or just the air handler. Because we have all these wireless probes, we can bring all the data in at once and it allows it to be done in a whole different way, and then the data is stored by uh, future use for all. How are we improving the process? Well, the big thing we were doing, if we use MeasureQuick correctly, and we've seen this happen, we had a customer out in Texas that implemented this. Uh, he had a 400% ROI in the first year of including, you know, buying the tools and, and uh, using this process. Eliminating the callbacks, truck rolls, ability to use lower skilled technicians, um, increase the efficiency of your highly skilled labor. We're, we're gonna talk about this, but there's a huge labor shortage in our industry, and we need to make sure we're using our best, our best techs to the best of their ability. Faster, more accurate diagnosis. By the time the system stabilizes with MeasureQuick, I can tell you what's wrong with it, right? I mean, if you think about what's going on there, we start the system up, we're gonna talk a little bit about stability, but in literally the time it takes the system to stabilize, 10 to 15 minutes, I can tell you what's wrong with the system at the end of that time. Eliminate uh, transcribed readings, fewer errors, faster service, increased customer satisfaction. People that go out and use this, the, their customers love to see the, uh, the, the way we're scanning the system now. Increased technician satisfaction. Guys are finding more problems than they ever found before. Easier field technical support, more professional look, future service, um, and like I said, digital data. Callbacks, I want, if you guys that are technicians, I don't know that you really appreciate this. I took this picture, it's uh, some good friends of mine, Jackson Comfort Systems, and I, I love this picture because it shows one thing. You notice that there's a sea of white shirts and blue shirts. All those white shirts inside there, those are all the people that are in the office. All the blue shirts are the people that work out outside the office, right? When we talk about a callback cost, everyone that's not in that truck, everybody that's in that company that's in that white shirt is overhead. Everybody. So when you, when you guys are talking about uh, rolling a callback on a truck, you got to look at not only what's the cost of a callback, you got to look at the hourly wage of all those people, all the overhead costs the advertising, the admin, the wages, vacation, training wages, payroll taxes, workers comp, general insurance, health group, uniforms, right? Your facility costs, the cost of this building, the rent. You take all the associated costs of a company, you add them all together, right? And you divide it in the hours and you start looking at a typical company costs between 450 to $1,000 an hour to operate, all right, working hours. Eliminating those callbacks is gonna really end your bottom line. Where do you use Measure Quick? Primarily, we're used for HVAC quality installation standards, building performance, Title 24, Energy Star, tab work, electrical, combustion emissions. We go across the gamut for what it's used. What we are really trying to do with Measure Quick is take something that's very sophisticated or complicated and put it in a, in a visual format that people can easily understand. You can look right away, you can see target zones, you can see if things are higher or lower, in or outside of targets, so we can see trends. This is actually a core tool that's not opening all the way in the middle. Displaying the data digitally and, and showing it over time has a huge amount of benefits that we'll cover in here. Just so you, you know, Measure Quick, download it on the App Store. You can get it at uh, iOS or Apple. It's uh, minimum iPhone 5, Google Play, Android 5.0. Uh, you can just download it. Pretty easy to do. 
when you install it the first time, it is going to ask you for a login. It checks for updates. Now, this is one of the most important things. If you don't, and we have guys at all time, believe it or not, especially some of the older guys that get a smartphone, they have never closed an app on their phone. They have 50, 60 apps open on their phone. Periodically, you have to go in and close those apps up. And when you close the app up and you reopen it again, MeasureQuick is going to go back out and look for any updates on there. And it'll update your software. We can push you updates through MeasureQuick without having to update your app. It's pretty slick. So somebody called the other day and said, hey, can you add a refrigerant? And I'm working on some new refrigerant, and it's not in MeasureQuick. In a couple of hours, they had the guys had the refrigerant loaded. We pushed an update out. And it, when you guys opened your app up, you may not have realized what was there, but it was a new refrigerant for a user. Does your login credentials, the Sensi, we'll talk a little bit about that, has its own permission level. If you're a Sensi contractor, uh, you can add and manage your users on there. And then um, on the cloud side, we're going to allow you to access rights. Talk a little bit about cloud, but the big thing we're going to be doing in the, in the close future here is uh, adding some services on here, allow you to do things like stream data. At the top of Measure Quick, there's a little guy in that circle right there. If you tap on that guy, that's going to that's going to tell you um, about your it's going to tell you your application version, some other information on there. This is our, our home screen to Measure Quick on here. But you tap the about screen to check your current visions and permissions. So when you pull that up there. It's going to open up this, this screen. Now, you can see here I've got permissions checked. These are our uh, energy programs we have that are using MeasureQuick on here. Yours will probably say basic commissions. If you're doing Sensi, you'll have Sensi down here at the bottom. But uh, we're putting the ability in so you can add your logo to your reports, your company logos. And then uh, in this case here, if I'm in a development mode, and a lot of guys we have on our beta testers, they're in the development mode. So you might get software that other people don't have, but sometimes you gotta, if you have a bug, you'll take it in or out of development uh, if you're on there. But that is where you test your modes and see how things are working. The home screen is where we got all our system information, outdoor, indoor measurements, electrical, weather, live data streaming down there. Uh, that little button down here at the, at the bottom right here, this is live data streaming. That's gonna be uh, uh, out in February here. Uh, Brian's group has actually got permissions to use that right now. We can actually stream data from MeasureQuick to any other user, either a MeasureQuick user or somebody at the office or even a factory technical support. Uh, anybody that's got an internet browser can, can view that on there. So let's walk through a little bit on the, on the process. So a couple of different modes I want to make sure people understand. There are multiple modes to MeasureQuick. Up here, this little uh, house button on here, if you tap on that house button, that enables you to enter the AC uh, cooling mode, heat pump and the heating. So this is a heat pump, cooling, uh, heat pump or air conditioner cooling only. Heat pump and the heating mode, gas furnace or boiler. These are non-invasive tests we'll talk about. We also do non-invasive uh, tests for heat pumps and the heating, and then we have a refrigeration application that's in beta right now. So these are all the modes of MeasureQuick. So MeasureQuick's not just an air conditioning tool. It goes across the gamut for heating or cooling on there. and. Uh, and then we're also tying in a couple of other apps. Um, so the Sensi app for electrical diagnostics will tie in here. And then down below that will actually be the, Blue Flint, or the BlueVac app so you can bring the uh, results from your BlueVac testing back in. There's also multiple views in MeasureQuick. And this down here is our, our view icon on here. So you can switch from the main view to the trending view to the system vitals view. I got some information on the system vitals view. We'll go over in a second. This is probably... Uh, the most interesting screen at, recently on MeasureQuick, I think a lot of you guys will get a lot out of this when we go over this mode, but this is probably one of my favorite pieces that we put into MeasureQuick lately. And the vitals view, if you get these things in line, then the rest of the system performance will follow. And I'll cover that in a little, little while here. Just a couple other notes here. Working in a toolbox, Testo, Fieldpiece, BlueVac, Redfish, uh, iManifold, all these different tools, once you put them in your toolbox, they're stored there. The other thing we do is we store your tool configuration. So if you map your probes, your mappings are stored. If you delete your probes and reinstall your probes, your mappings are still in there. So it'll go back to the way you had it mapped. So we do a lot with the toolbox uh, box management to make sure that it's managed. One of the biggest problems we have in MeasureQuick is you have to tell it what each probe is doing, right? And I don't say it's a problem, it's just a matter of you have to map each one of the probes. So you have to tell it, which probes your low pressure, which probes your high pressure, what's on your liquid line, what's on your discharge line, what's in your supplier. So we can make sure that those probes are mapped to the right locations on there. That's probably one of the biggest problems we have is when somebody says it's not reading on the home screen, it's because they don't have it mapped. Today, when you download MeasureQuick and you activate, let's say, your field piece probes, they're automatically going to map to a default configuration, but you can tap those and change those if you need to. So we do auto mapping on that now. Here's, here's where we get into the meat of things. 
So when you get into a project with MeasureQuick, the first thing you want to do is deploy your probes, all right? Because if you think about the process of what we're doing, we're going to need to get the time, the system's time to stabilize, so, and we're going to do some data input and set up MeasureQuick. So the first thing we want to do is get our probes in place. Now, in this case here, I'm working on a cooling system. So it's a, actually a heat pump system, but I'm in cooling mode here, so I've got my suction line pressure on the suction line, liquid line pressure over here. Uh, I've got clamps on the suction line, the discharge line, the liquid line. I'm measuring some power coming in here. Suction line temperature, uh, six to eight inches away from the compressor. You need to make sure that you're not too close to the compressor because the compressor gives off heat and it will influence your superheat reading. Liquid line temperature near the service valve. This is a mistake a lot of guys make all the time. You, you always want to measure your temperature wherever you're measuring your pressure because there's a temperature pressure relationship that we're trying to determine. How much superheat, how much subcooling, there's pressure drops in the lines and components. So I can't mount my suction line temperature all the way inside the house and measure pressure outdoors and determine what my evaporator superheat is. If I want to measure evaporator superheat, I have to measure pressure at the evaporator and temperature at the evaporator, or I've got to account for the losses in there, which is typically about three PSI drop through the uh, suction line on there. Return air wet bulb and dry bulb temperature at the return air grill. Supplier wet bulb and dry bulb at the closest supplier inlet. Outdoor air, out of line of sight of the sun, so we want to measure it with an outdoor air probe, and electrical. One of the guys was telling me yesterday, he was using MeasureQuick, and he was using uh, just the outdoor air temperature from the weather data. You don't want to do that. He said, uh, he said, I couldn't believe how much difference it made to actually have an outdoor air temperature sensor at the condensing unit. Because the heat, if you think about, we're standing out here on a concrete, the heat, the concrete's hot, it's up to 140, 150 degrees, it's radiating heat, warming up the air around it, we're pulling that warm air into our condenser, we need to make sure that we're seeing what's going into the condensing unit. Measure quick, one of the things that, that uh, a lot of guys make a mistake on is probe placement. This is probably, if you want to get an accurate uh, idea of what your system performance is, and you can see here I've got probe one here at the filter grill, I want to, I want to have this probe in measuring the return air right, at, right next to the filter grill, these are magnetics, uh, field piece does a great job with this. It's probably why you see me use these more than any of the other probes out there because they're, they have some features on them that make it easy to, easy to use. This probe here does not have to be up in the filter grill. It's just right here at the return air stream. We're also going to measure air at the supply air. And what I usually do is go through the blower, out of line of sight of the evaporator coil. Just like we have radiant heating in a furnace where we have, you know, we get too close to heat exchanger, it influences the heating. If you're too close to the evaporator coil, it'll influence the temperature probe and you'll get a bad uh, temperature drop across there. So typically the first supplier run. What this does is now as I'm testing all the way from the return out to the supply. Now who's used uh, MeasureQuick and seen uh, um, potential return air duct leakage show up? A handful of you guys. And I was just talking to people saying, wow, I couldn't even, I couldn't even figure that out, but somehow I figured out we had return air duct leakage. I got up in there and sure as heck I had a leak in my return air duct. The reason we can do that is because we're looking at design temperature differences of the evaporator coil and the return air on here. So if you're measuring up here in the evaporator coil, then this air could be 74 degrees down here and 84 degrees up here. That feature will not work. So it's really important that you're measuring return air at the return air filter grill inlet, and that'll help you find those problems that you might otherwise overlook on there. This and this one, you notice that I have this probe up in the supply air duct. You've got to go in the supply air duct. You can't put it on the face of the filter grill, right? That was one of the mistakes I made when we designed the I-manifold was the, the magnets held it up next to the filter grill. As soon as air comes out of a duct, it actually entrains air behind it. If you've ever seen a lot of like dirt around registers at restaurants and things, that's because the air is coming out, the register so fast that it's actually cold, cold, pulling air in behind it and mixing with the room air. It's actually creating a vortex around there. Just like if you think about Top Gun when the airplane took off, you saw those contrails come out and turn, right? It's the exact thing happened out of a register. Well, what happens if we're not in the register is we get a mixed air temperature. So the face of the register will a lot of times give us a mixed air temp. If you have really high velocity, like you have it coming up and it's turning and you're at the bottom, all the air is coming out the top and it's pulling in the room air and you can actually get a negative pressure on the front of a supply air grill and have a positive pressure coming out the top. And it all depends on your ductile design and how that register terminates. So you need to be in the supplier register. I can't, can't overstate how important that is to get a, a good, good capacity. Now, the other thing that this does for us, if we have return air capacities low, we're going to start to look for duct leakage because this is going to affect our temperature split of our system. So if you got a, is, is, if you've got multiple return air grills, get it, get it on your closest return air grill so you can get, or we can do multiple temp temperatures now. One of the things we just introduced in the measure quick was you can have multiple return air measurements. So you, can, you can get an average return air temperature, an average supply air temperature. 
Um, that is one way to do it. On, on, in Ohio, we have systems that are all ducted returns every single room. So then what we do is we, we, we go in the return air drop, uh, you know, a few feet from the blower, but we don't have the issue of, you know, what right now, the reason we're showing this way is because this is outside the envelope. It depends on if, you're, if your system is in the envelope or outside the envelope of how much duct, how much duct leakage is going to impact performance of the system. In this case here, if we've got a 130, 130 degree attic, this thing's going to be the death of me. If we have a 130 degree attic here and we're pulling that air in the return air, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a problem. But uh, out of line of sight of the evaporator coil is one of the key things here, so I don't want to be up in here where I can see the evaporator coil. Um, so at a, you know, at, a, at a reasonably close return, close to the system uh, is ideal, and then we'll show you some things on duct leakage uh, later in there. Inside the grill, yeah. Yep, just go right inside the grill. Again, the field piece ones are really nice and flexible, so you can just bend that up and go right inside the grill with that. All right, so you could have been pulling a lot of, believe it or not, even though you can't find it at the return, there's ways, I'll show you a slide ahead, how we can check for duct leakage. But, but if, if it picks up duct leakage, th there's a pretty good odds that you have it there. And I'll explain a little bit in diagnostics. So one of the things, and I'll, I probably have a slide up this, but one of the things I wanna explain on diagnostics is, is uh, all our diagnostics are probability based. So when you see a diagnostic pop up on Measure Quick, and there's a little number next to it that says two or three or four, that is three or four symptoms of that. So if it says a three next to it, there's three symptoms of duct leakage. Here's what they are, and those are in the minor faults. I'll cover that in another slide here. But it doesn't definitively, this measure quick will always require a technician. It's gonna say you have a symptom of this, right? If, if, we, if we think about a, a, a symptom of low airflow is low suction pressure. That's also a symptom of low charge, right? That's also a symptom of a restricted dryer. It's also a, a symptom of a dirty blower wheel. It's a symptom of it. So we, we can't definitively tell you what, uh, what everything is, but I can tell you what the, that there's symptoms of it. And when we get enough symptoms of that, then I can definitively say, yeah, here's what you're looking at. So if you ever see a, a measure quick one you can't clear out, there's usually five or more symptoms of that, and we're very sure that's what's wrong with your system. We'll cover that in a, in a slide coming up here. So after we get our probes deployed, right, we're talking about the process of using measure quick here. So we, we, we've got it downloaded, it's on our phone, we've got our probes mapped, we, we deploy our probes, we're gonna start the system, and then we're gonna let things take time to stabilize. So now is when we're gonna start a project. The reason that I'm going over this, again, it's improvement of the process. How do we use Measure Quick? How do we get the job done quickly? Because if we do this right, right, and there's a lot of slides here, but if we do this right, in the amount of time that it takes for the system to stabilize, I can have the diagnostics done and a report generated on here. Tests are organized, it depends on what you do. We're, um, again, in February here, we're releasing a Service Titan uh, integration. This is actually uh, uh, working right now. So you can click on the refresh button, it'll show the projects that are assigned to you. You can click on one of these projects and start and that'll pre-populate some of the data. After you pick the type of the customer that you wanna use, then you're gonna pick the type of workflow. We have workflows built in for like Blue On. This is a, a refrigerant retrofit workflow. This is for Sensi Smart Maintenance. I'm going to uh, just use that one as an example in here. But uh, uh, each one of these products can be assigned. We, we pick the type of work we want to do. We click the test type, and then we're going to start the process. So in this case here, when we, when we click on that Sensi Predict one, it's going to fill in all the details about the project, the job site, and equipment information, because all that came off of Sensi in there. And that's going to dump us right into measurements. So the idea now is we're eliminating some of the fat fingering of all the data in the measure quick, which is probably one of the harder things when you're doing an application like this. All right, project notes. You can add any notes specific to the project. Those will be able to be added in at the office. So if somebody wants to type in some notes, here's what I'm here to do. You can type that in. And then that information submitted and validated as part of the data entry, or you can put notes in and send them back up. Whenever you complete a section, you're gonna get a green check mark next to it. And right now, the, what needs to be completed is a measurement. So anytime we get into like a, a section of it, once we complete that section, it's gonna to go to red, or green, excuse me. Job site details. A lot of guys miss this. And one of the things we're trying to do in Measure Quick is eliminate the duplicate data entry. So once we have a guy go out once, the idea is nobody has to enter that data again. We're gonna store that data in the cloud. The laser and the mouse buttons are just too darn close on this. You wanna drag and drop that pin on the building you're on. So when you drag and drop that pin, so you're gonna get a little dot that's gonna show, a round dot's gonna show your physical location, and then this flag, we wanna drag and drop that it on. It's gonna pull in the address here, and it's gonna pre-populate that address on, the, on MeasureQuick, so you don't have to type it in. If the office has entered in this information, it'll pull in automatically, otherwise you're gonna type that information in. 
This is now the most important one, is, is, is geotagging the equipment. So in this case here, I'm on this rooftop, I can drag and drop that pin specifically on that rooftop. If I'm in a house or something like that, I'm gonna drag it over to where the condensing unit's at. Each piece of equipment will have its own geolocation, every single one. So that when you mark that location, when you come back out again, you'll be able to select the pin on the map. And when you tap that pin, it'll pull all the information down about that project so you can start your work. So the idea is here it's one and done. Once you have it done once, we're gonna be able to grab that data and use it going forward. Drag it on the exact location of the system and each system will have a unique geolocation. It's especially handy when you're working on things like malls or other places where you got equipment that may or may not be yours where you can mark each piece of equipment on there. Entering your system information. Take photos. On there you'll see you can take a photo of anything. The photos will now print out on the report so we'll be able to tie those in there. There's a barcode scan on there. On the, on the right hand side if you tap that barcode scanner it will pull up. There are barcodes and QR codes all over equipment. Uh, if anybody in here is a, a Goodman dealer, if you scan the QR code, it'll populate Goodman, model number, serial number, off the equipment. It'll just type in everything for you so you don't have to mess with that. We're doing more and more of these as we got, but it'll, this will work across the board with a lot of different manufacturers. This is a ream unit here, and as soon as I scan that barcode there, it pulls in all the information off the barcode. Most important step, profiling the system. Now, this is pretty interesting when you talk about profile because with MeasureQuick, we need to know what you're working on. Right, if we're going to do accurate diagnostics, I need to know, is it 20, R22, is it R410A, is it 13 SEER, is it 17 SEER? Is it, is it designed to have 350 CFM per ton or 450 CFM per ton? Right, this is garbage in, garbage out. If you don't take the time to profile the system and tell us a little bit of information about what you're working on, you're not going to get accurate diagnostics. This is a, this is a technician that, that calls you and said, hey, I'm, I'm uh, working on a rooftop unit. What's the most common problem with that? Right? I mean, you guys have all gotten those calls. It's like, are you serious? Can you give me a little more information here? Right? We need a little more information too. So target superheat, target subcooling, type of metering device. You can't evaluate the charge on a system without knowing what kind of metering device you have. What superheat should I have? What external static pressure do I have? This is the most important step in Measure Quick. This is where you need to spend time with your technicians. This is where you need to spend time with yourselves. Because once you profile the system, now this is a this is a, a, a profile is a starting place. Eventually we're gonna benchmark and I'll cover that a little bit further ahead. But a profile, every system is a function of its installation, right? So when I tell you I got a, a 13 sear system here, I could have a 13 sear system with a 50 foot line set or a 150 foot line set or a 10 foot line set. Is that gonna change anything? Does line set length change anything with the system performance? Sure, it degrades performance. What about pressure drop between the, the evaporator coil and the condenser? Absolutely, right? You might, have to you might have to tweak your subcooling a little bit higher for the length and lift of the line set. So when we're setting this up initially, it's like, hey, what do you have to start with? And then we're gonna eventually benchmark that system on there. Equipment installation. So we, we're gathering additional information in Measure Quick, and some of this is active now, some of it is for future. Line set length. <coughs> um, line set length and line set location. Out here in Florida, what's a common thing we do with the line sets? We have a lot of slab homes, so where do the line sets go? Underground. What, what temperature, uh, uh, we're looking at things like approach, right? A lot of times we're looking at, uh, we might be in the house and we're measuring line set temperature um, in there. What's going to happen when a line set runs through the ground? Now, there's water in the ground. What's going to happen to the temperature of the line set? It's going to cool down, right? So we need to know, is that line set running through an attic? Is it running underground? That's part of the diagnostics of there. What's the line set length? We want to know that. The diameter of the liquid line, the suction line. How many returns do you have? What size are those returns? What size filter type do you have? What's the size of that filter? We're actually, one of the things that's going to be coming out very soon in Measure Quick is a, a filter face velocity on the filters. Because a lot of, we're seeing a lot of filter grills that are undersized, a lot of filters that are undersized. So we can look at we want to typically have around 250 feet per minute face velocity across the filter. So you got to look at the amount of area of your filter and the pleats, and we can determine if you have a large enough filter grill in there. Electric, inter, electrical information. Now in here, this is another a piece that a lot of guys overlook. Condensing unit phase and voltages on here. We want to make sure that we enter each one of those. Evaporator fan type, PSC versus ECM. We're looking at things like power factor, right? At, uh, an ECM motor has a power factor between 0 0.55, 0 0.65, or a PSC should have a, uh, a, a power factor of 1.0. So again, telling us this information is gonna make the diagnostics more powerful. 
We've also added in capacitors in here so that now we can collect the capacitor data. So if you, if uh, Sensi's picking up a capacitor's failing, you can pull this project up and you can see what the capacitors are on that, on that system. So we're pulling that and then if, also it adds in if you have a start assist device or a start capacitor with the start capacitor size and, and the others. Uh, that's, that's just been added in recently. So once we get all this information and now you're in the, uh, the screen where we can look at, we, the check marks are telling that I have all my outdoor measurements in, and that means they're streaming data in. Uh, this little check marks mean I'm streaming in my outdoor data, I'm streaming, streaming my indoor data, my electrical measurements, and my performance calculations. All those things are coming in, and we're, right now what we're waiting for is the system to stabilize. This little icon right here is telling us that the system is not stable, okay? So all the readings are in, but we don't want to run diagnostics yet because the system is not stable. When you guys start an air conditioning system up, does it immediately start blowing cold air? No, it doesn't. It takes several minutes for it to, to get to its peak capacity. So you can't evaluate the performance of a system until the system is stabilized. What things would tell us that the system is stable? What are we waiting for? Anybody know off the top of their head? Well, it might be condensation. We're waiting for the condensate to come out. That's maybe a good indicator. It's run for a little while. In Florida here, it's coming out all the time. What are we looking at? What ratings will we be watching? What, what helps us determine if the system is stable? Superheat's one. Superheat takes into account two variables. What two variables? Well, not, 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 uh, I was looking for a different answer. Pressure and temperature. So when the temperature's stable, the pressure's stable, we know the superheat's stable. Subcooling, sub same thing. We're looking at the pressure of the system, the temperature of the system. When both those are stable, we're stable. Another uh, big one, the one that takes the longest, believe it or not, is temperature split. Because what's happening when we start that system up is the, the, all the refrigerant could be in the condenser and the evaporator, but it's systems, the refrigerant's got to move around and, and, and equalize out. And once the temperature split is stable, then we can also determine it's stable. So Measure Quick is watching the suction line pressure and temperature, the liquid line pressure and temperature, and also watching the, the temperature split to determine if the system is stable or not. Well, that system stabilizing, you do not, in fact, in this slide here, uh, we want to wait till the system is stable before we, we, before we make electrical readings, all right? So when we start a system up, here's, here's what I want to talk about with, with, with equipment refrigerant migration and, and, uh, and the charge moving around the system. Right here, you can see that, that both these things are stable. Right here, the pressures are equalized. So I start the system up, and we got the suction line temp and the liquid line temp, right? We're just looking at temperatures here right now. The, the, the suction line temp starts to drop, comes back up, starts to drop again. Same thing here, we got this going up and down. The system's not stable on there, right? How does Measure Quick determine stability? Again, the liquid line, suction line, temperature split. So if we're looking at things that are happening here, I think this one, the next one's the high and low pressure. Again, you'll see that when the pressure starts up, the refrigerant right here on the bottom, the low pressure, it actually emptied out the evaporator a little bit. So it dropped down and refrigerant's coming out of the evaporator and it's, and it, this pressure dropped down and it's slowly building back up and it's modulating. Temperature here and then here we're looking at superheat and subcooling. Now I want you to notice here, unstable, 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 yet here we got a green flag, right? We're running a rolling out algorithm here that determines that even though, what is this a symptom of right here? What do we see right here? This is superheat. It's hunting a little bit or modulating, right? It's right at the threshold where we have a low load on there. Is this system stable? If you were to run this out, you'd see this run for the next hour. You'd see the TXV doing this, right? What is that an indication of? What could, what could be happening? What could cause a TXV to modulate like that or, or hunt like that? Bulb placements, one, what else? No. <laughs> Go away. Yeah, it, low load, this is actually low load on this is causing this to happen. Low load, a lot of times when the TXV is trying to uh, control, when the load gets very low, any, as soon as it opens, it's too much refrigerant, so it, it, it senses it, it's, TXVs are always reactive. They, they're always watching what came out, the, and it opened, and it's, it, then it's measuring what happened, and then it's making an adjustment. So it's where, if you think about the TXVs on the inlet of the coil, we're measuring on the outlet of the coil, it's always reacting to what it did. Right? So in this case here, even though this is modulating, right, this isn't hunting and flooding. We talk about hunting and flooding means it goes from 20 degrees down to zero degrees and then back up again. This is just the TXV modulating. And, the, and uh, so this is actually a stable system. So Measure Quick can determine if the system is stable, even if it doesn't look like it's stable, because this is as stable as it's ever going to get, right? 
If we took a rolling average of this, it's, it's, uh, it's within that rolling average. So after we get the system stable, this is probably one of my favorite screens, and I'll tell you how this whole screen came about. All right, so I was down in, uh, I was down in Florida and came down here and I was working with a property management company. We got skill levels from, you know, if the skill levels are up here, they got skill levels that start about here and they, and they go down to um, uh, uh, the guy that's just carrying around a hose and a tank of gas, right? Um, these are guys, and I'm not kidding you, when they, when they said a refrigerant was a drop-in replacement, that they just dropped it in on top of the R22, right? So I got mixed gas on every system we go to. We just got a hell of a mess out there. So one of the things I figured out right away is, wow, Measure Quick was way overcomplicated. There was way too much information here, and uh, it was designed for a guy. I'm, I'm, I'm an HVAC nerd. I can't help it. I love, I love this stuff. But I'm thinking, okay, how can I simplify Measure Quick into one screen? Because if you get these things right, the performance of the system will follow. Okay? So in this case here, we're going to select your type of metering device. In this case, it's a TXV. So if you tap on this, it's going to allow you to select whether you got a TXV, a fixed orifice, a piston, whatever it is. You're going to tap on this to select your airflow. Okay? It's going to walk you through a process here. So basically, superheat and subcooling are how full of the, how full of the coils are refrigerant. We're making sure how, how full the coils are refrigerant. We're making sure we have enough airflow. We're making sure that our, our high and low pressure are transferring the heat at the right rate. A lot of guys don't understand this. I'll cover it in the next slide. An approach is, an, is one that our industry doesn't look at enough. Approach will tell you more about system operation than just about any other reading when it comes to the condenser. Why is that? Well, approach is how close is the liquid line temperature to the outdoor air. The liquid line temperature should always be slightly above the outdoor air temperature. And what it tells us is when approach is, is the system, is the coil dirty? We have a really high approach, is the condenser coil dirty? Or if we have a really low approach, do we have too much refrigerant in the system or is the coil wet, right? A lot of times after we wash the coil, it, is, it becomes an evaporative condenser, it's vaporizing stuff off there. So approach is one of the readings that we really wanna watch closely to determine if the system is operating correctly. If you just get these readings right, everybody gets fixated on performance of the system and they go look at the performance and they're like, wow, this is, this is complicated. If you get these readings right, everything else will fall into place. So what we did on here is we have a quick charge method on here. When you, when you start this quick charge, it'll walk you through a process. If you have the field piece scale, it'll actually ask you a bunch of different questions, how much refrigerant's in the system or what tonnage is in the system. It'll actually tell you in pounds and ounces how much gas to add or remove. It'll tell you if you need to stop and adjust the blower speed up or down. It'll tell you if you need to adjust your TXV, if you have an adjustable TXV, if you need to, or to uh, uh, adjust the TXV open or closed. We built this out for two reasons. One was for Blue-On. Blue-On's an R22 replacement refrigerant. So I went out, one of the things we were doing with this property management firm was going out, they have tons of R22 equipment and property management companies that want to make that equipment last forever. Out here in Florida, if you own a, a, one, of these prop, you know, one of these properties, you want to make sure that that stuff lasts forever. They, they don't want to invest any money in changing equipment out. So one of the things they were interested in is refrigerant retrofit. When we start retrofitting refrigerants, sometimes we have to adjust the TXV to get the superheat correct, and this was a way of doing that. So it literally walks you through step by step and tells you what to do next. And the algorithms are pretty impressive. We actually figured out how much refrigerant you need to add per either, either by tonnage or by the, by the weight, but I'll tell you even down to what line to add it into. A couple of things, we look at, at, at at heat transfer, right? Going back here, somebody asked, why do, we, why do we care about the high and low pressures are in line? So the high and the low pressure, the, the only, we only measure pressure for what reason? We only, there's only one reason we measure pressure. I don't even know why we have pressure gauges anymore. Temperature, temperature right. I would, I would have a saturation temperature gauge, right? That's the only reason we measure pressure is so we can get corresponding saturation temperature. And we probably would have saturation temperature gauges if we didn't have 300 different refrigerants that we had to have a scale for each gauge on there. So we, we only measure pressure to get the corresponding saturation temperature. And the key thing that you gotta remember here is that heat transfer, what are we doing in our industry? We're moving heat from a place where we don't want it to a place where it doesn't matter. Heat transfer is a function of time, temperature difference, and turbulence. A dirty condenser will drive the subcooling up on a machine. Okay, so there's two symptoms. There's also two symptoms on overcharge, right? High head pressure and high subcooling. I need to visually inspect this condenser and see if the condenser is clean. If I clear this fault out, well, then the odds are it's an overcharge. There's also a, a symptom of a restricted liquid line here, right? Restricted liquid line could be the, the high subcooling on there or the high head pressure on there. So 
if you run across the fault, like the high subcooling here, you can tap on the targets. A lot of people don't realize the measure quick. Every single target has information built behind it. If you see a symptom, you don't know what's wrong with it, tap on the target. It'll tell you what that specific thing means. It'll tell you uh, what to do about it. And we tied in a lot of the articles Brian's written of, on HVAC school back with us in what called just in time education. So tip the faults, get more information. The faults on this are very, very, the, the fault testing on here works very, very well. We've been down and done some testing at NIST labs on this. We've done a, a lot of different um, tests. And this is, if you're skilled at what you do, it's even fun to see if you're right or not. So I found this to be quite, quite handy on here. Down here, we got five symptoms of a potential duct leak. A lot of guys, again, don't realize if when you see a fault and you're going to diagnostics, if you tap on that fault, it'll tell you what the, what the issue is, what you need to check on it, what the, and what this is going to cause. These are great talking points for your customers. Mrs. Jones, I just ran a scan in your system, and it looks like you have a potential return air duct leak. I need to investigate that first. Once we get that fixed, then I'll be able to go through and test the rest of the stuff. What's interesting is that most of the time you clear out the top level fault, you're gonna clear out all the faults that are behind it because there's other symptoms there. So make sure you're taking the time to do this. Think about a return air duct leak. Is that gonna affect your sensible capacity? Absolutely it will, right? It's also gonna drive your head pressure up because now instead of pulling in 74 degree air, I might be pulling 83 degree air from my attic, right? So once I clear out that duct leakage problem, these other two problems can go away. And it's really important to understand that, that uh, in the measure quick. Now this one, is if you're going to focus on capacity, this is probably one of the more important slides here. Now I want you to notice pressures spot on, everything's spot on. I'm running here actual capacity. I'm running 80 percent, 80 percent normalized. So I'm, I'm only running 80 percent of my capacity. Now a couple things Measure Quick does. Here's my nominal capacity: 1.5 tons, 18,000 BTUs. We correct it for the load conditions. Whenever, you're, whenever you look at an extended performance table on a piece of equipment, it'll tell you under these conditions, here's how we expect it to perform. We run that calculation and measure quick and we stabilize, we normalize the capacity. So out of this ton and a half nominal, I'm, I'm expecting to see 15,911 BTUs. I'm actually only getting 12,800 BTUs, which is 80% of this normalized capacity. My sensible capacity is at 96.7%. That is probably the most important number in Measure Quick right there when you're looking at equipment performance. My latent capacity, I'm, I'm only doing 407 BTUs. Why is that? Why is that? I'm running a dry coil. Yeah, it's, it's, it's wintertime in Ohio. I ran, I'm running this in my office right now. It's running 13% of the capacity. I'm doing 95% sensible heat ratio. There's just no humidity to remove. There's no humidity to remove, right? Here's the thing, a lot of guys make, the, the energy programs are making a huge mistake. The guys are going out and they're saying, oh, we're gonna look at total capacity. We need to get the total capacity up and we're gonna get the, the sear increase. So the guys are going out there and they were slowing down the evaporator fan on the system so they could start to get latent cooling. And they were simply transitioning the sensible cooling to latent cooling. The problem is, is that what is the only thing that satisfies your thermostat? Sensible heat, right. If you want to increase efficiency of a system, shut it off, right? <laughs> That's the best way to increase efficiency of the system. If, if the thing is trying to dehumidify 24 hours, seven days a week, and it can't satisfy the sensible load, it's just going to run and run and run and run. That's the biggest problem we have. We talk about low airflow on systems. Right? That's why it's such a problem, because we're taking the work that we want to do, the sensible work that we want to do, and we're converting it to latent load removal. And that's great if you have humidity to remove. If this was Arizona, and this is a very typical problem in Arizona, I go out there all the time, and we see a lot of systems running at 80% of their nominal capacity. Right? I can speed up that blower and get a little more sensible cooling out of that system. There's no humidity removed there. Right? All I have is, is a, a dry climate out there. So these are really important. When you're looking at this number, that's the number you want to fixate on, right? Let's talk about what can, what can destroy sensible cooling on there. Dirty condenser, what happens to the temperature of the liquid line? It goes up. So now that liquid, that hot liquid's got to go through the metering device and we get an increase in what as it goes through the metering device? Flash gas, very good. We get an increase in flash gas and that flash gas then is liquid that's converting to vapor to cool the remaining liquid down to the saturation temperature, right? 
that erodes the capacity of the coil. We don't want to have flash gas if we can avoid it. We want the liquid line temperature as close to the saturation temperature of the evaporator as we can get it. That's why an increase in subcooling will increase the efficiency. If we have a dirty condenser, we're going to have low, uh, low sensible cooling. Low airflow, low sensible cooling, right? Condenser air recirculation, low sensible cooling. Measure Quick takes all those things into account and makes sure that you're getting, uh, that, we're, that we're not eroding, you know, that we can find these problems on there. Duct leakage, sensible cooling is going to be affected, all those different things. After we get the system all set, we're going to benchmark the system. Benchmarking, when you hit the benchmark button, you're going to see all the targets that are uh, driven by, driven by the, the design of the machine go to the centers like this. That benchmark is designed so that every technician going back out to that system in, in the future is going to set up to the benchmark. This is the, the reason that, in fact, this is the big reason we work with Emerson on Sensi. Okay, I want you to understand why this is so important. When the, initially, Sensi, when they would install Sensi systems on systems, they were just monitoring poorly operating systems. Think about that for a minute. The guys will go out, they put the Sensi system on. Sensi is a monitor. It doesn't really know what's wrong until it, until it runs for several weeks or several months and it's got enough data now that it can say, hey, something doesn't look right here, right? It can't tell right away. Measure Quick, when we set up the system with Measure Quick and we set that benchmark, we're telling Sensi where to monitor from, right? This is one of my big, big complaints when I talked to the guys at Nest one time when we were with the iManifold. I'm like, listen, all that thermostat does is better control a poorly operating system. It's not taking care of the problems. If you want to really take care of the problems, get the charge right, get the airflow right, and people will associate those savings. This is why if, if you take the time and you install that Sensi system and you benchmark the system first, your performance is going to go up, the utility bills will go down, you're going to eliminate that second truck roll. That's what we're trying to do when we're doing a benchmark in the system. It assures the efficiency, rate of capacity, Proper latent sensible split measurement, uh, normalizes measurements for the installation and allows non-invasive testing going forward. This is a key thing here. Once we set up the equipment once, we're never going to hook up gauges to it again. I'll talk about that in the next slide coming up. So literally in the time it took the system to stabilize, if I either get a green flag telling me the system's operating properly or I go through my diagnostics and I make the repair, I'll save those measurements. It's going to save that, again, that exact geolocation of the equipment. If you forgot to geolocate your equipment, you can just go back into the measurements tab, go into the job site, move the equipment pin, and then you can regenerate your report on MeasureQuick. On those reports, a lot of guys don't realize you can just swipe them and delete them. If you, if you have multiple screenshots or multiple reports, swipe and delete, and you can get rid of those. Quick test, mid-February. This is some pretty cool stuff. We have a temperature compensated pressure test. This is actually live. I was doing this test at the office again here. It measures the suction line temp. The liquid line temp, or sorry, sorry, suction line, well actually this is going to be suction line temp, high side pressure and temperature. Uh, I just had my guys switch that on there. It takes a date and time stamp, measures the start temperature, and then what it does is it, it's constantly um, correcting this for the uh, change in temperature. So nitrogen actually has a temperature pressure relationship. A lot of guys don't or they think inert means it doesn't do anything. Inert means it just doesn't react with uh, uh, oxidation or it's not an oxidizer in the system. Nitrogen, most definitely, when it changes in, in temperature, changes in pressure. So when you charge a system up and you're doing a pressure drop test and, uh, and it's 60 degrees out and you come back and it's 80 degrees in the afternoon, you better expect that pressure to rise. If that pressure is the same, then you have a leak and you lost that in that information. So this will do an automatic pass fail and it'll pass that back to measure quick. This one's probably my favorite one. This is a duct leakage test. And so what this does, and I've got a screenshot of this um, going forward, but it uses mixed air uh, calculations to estimate the capacity loss. So again, multiple sensors. We have a return air dry bulb sensor, a mixed air temperature sensor. You're gonna wanna use two of those. I'll explain that in just a minute. And your attic air temperature sensor. So what this is doing here is if the temperature in the return, the temperature at the, at the blower inlet should be exactly the same as the temperature at the filter grill. If it's not, if you're picking up a heat gain, the heat can only come from a couple places. Where would that heat come from? Leaking air is one. Where else could it come from? Radiant gain on the ductwork. So in Measure Quick, the other thing we're doing here is we're taking in your tonnage, the length of your run, the static pressure in that run, the 
and we're, we're calculating either the, 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 the area on the outside of that duct, either if it's a rectangular run or a round run, when you put in this area measurements here, what it's doing is, and you tap in the R value also, is it's eliminating the effect of radiant gain. So if, if it picks up a degree or two, and that's normal because of radiant heat gain, we're not gonna show you that as leakage in the duct work. It's just gonna normalize that out. So the key thing here is you wanna have a, a, a temperature probe on each side of the inlet of the blower. All right, so you're gonna want two of these uh, temperature probes. This is very, very important. If you've ever measured duct leakage, right, the air will come down and it'll track one side of the duct. So if you're, if you're measuring a temperature return on one side, it could be 74 degrees. On the opposite side, it could be 100 degrees. Because what's happening is the air follows a very laminar path. So as it, as it leaks in the ductwork, the hot air is gonna go all up the one side. Now when it goes in the volute, and the fan's mixing, you actually get this vortex in there. If we measure the mixed air temperature going in on both sides of the blower, I can pick up any duct leakage that you have on each side of the blower there. So we're gonna measure temperature of the return air grill, we're gonna measure temperature of the mixed air, I'm gonna measure temperature of the attic, and I'm gonna measure temperature in the supply air grill, and basically what it's doing is calculating the leakage in the duct system. This is probably in your area, in the Florida area, or if you have, if you have duct work outside the attic, this is probably one of the, one of the biggest um, problems that we're gonna run across. Now this is a duct leakage screening. We're normalizing it back to 25 pascals of pressure. If you wanna know your actual duct leakage, I highly recommend you use a duct blaster to do that. But this is a test to see if we have potential duct leakage that a field service technician can use in the field to figure out if they have a problem. You can, you can map the probes to the mixed air, yes. So right now we got, in fact, we have mappings in for up to four supplies, up to four returns. We're coming out very quickly with uh, multiple circuit mode, multi-circuit mode for measure quick. One of the challenges we found on big rooftop equipment was that you really couldn't measure a single point of temperature someplace in there. You had to have multiple returns and multiple supplies and average them to get a better reflective of what the equipment's doing. So um, a, another big advantage of the field piece probes is they beacon their signal, okay? Two different technologies. There's connected tools that they actually pair your Bluetooth and then the field piece stuff beacons the signal. So the, the field piece stuff is not, is not paired to your device. It just is saying, 74 degrees, 74 degrees, and I can, I can watch uh, 24 to 40, 40 probes on a field piece all day. With Testo, I can only do about eight, right, because I have to pair them to my device. So that's another big advantage of the, of the field piece probes is the way that they communicate with the system. Multi-circuits on the way. So here's a, just a, a little shot of uh, return errors, supply errors, how you can map those in. It'll do the average uh, averaging on there for you, up to four supply and four return. This is also good if you're testing a system and you just want to look at the different supplier temperatures around the house and make sure you're not getting a lot of thermal gain in one duct or another, but that's on the, on the way. And then a little bit on Sensi and Measure Quick on here. Uh, uh, probably one of my favorite parts of using Sensi is the fact that we can actually watch Sensi, all those probes become a, a additional probe in Measure Quick. So I can actually port the readings in of the suction line temperature, the liquid line temperature, I can pull in the uh, um, outdoor air voltage and uh, current. So what's really nice is once I have the, the Sunsea system on, I can walk out and do a non-invasive test and not even have to pull panels off the piece of equipment because all the electrical readings are coming in via the Sunsea equipment. So it, it, it's, it's really quite slick the way we've got this working and it streams the data straight into MeasureQuick. Now what's cool when you start a Sunsea project, it actually goes out and pulls all the data on the account name. So in here I'm picking our shop unit here It'll tell you if you got a problem and then you can actually start a project to measure quick. So there's a button to view live data. And if you view the live data, what that's gonna give you is like a, a little data log. If you start a project with measure quick, it's gonna open up and pre-populate all the data and then it'll allow us to uh, run our diagnostics and then allow us to um, see our things like voltage and amperage readings and, uh, into the system. Again, you can send that back to Sensi or we can save it to cloud, we'll submit the data, and literally now we can do a system in, in minutes. And this can be done remotely. So if you have a Sensi system, like right now I could dial into the Sensi system at our office and see and measure quick that view of how that system's operating uh, through, the, through the measure quick platform. So it literally becomes a remote, a remote probe. What's slick with this is the user interface your guys are used to, the measure quick user interface is the same interface that they look at on, the, uh, on measure quick. Email and print the report. So once we get this done, this is one a question we get a lot, is where do my reports go? Down at the bottom, there's a results tab. When you click on that results tab, you're gonna select the, 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 uh, the project you want, and then you just more or less hit share at the bottom, the report, 
and then you hit export as a PDF, and then you can, you can look at that or you can print it to the Measure Quick printer, and that's gonna bring up your report. Uh, very quickly, you'll see at the bottom there's some photos. I'll talk about that in just a second, but we'll email that report to the customer. Photo documentation's on the way. This is a new thing we just added into Measure Quick. The photos are all documented. You can add as many photos as you want of a particular thing and add any notes. So if you want to show something in Measure Quick, there's a disconnect level, a thermostat level, it'll pull that in and uh, uh, allow you to uh, tie those in with your reporting if you want to show those on your report. Virtuoso remote support. Again, February. We're gonna be able to hit a button on Measure Quick, stream the data, and anywhere you're at in the world, you'll be able to, to view that data remotely. So there's a desktop application, and that'll allow you to see that data remotely anywhere that you wanna watch it, all right? Am I running out of time, Brian? It's 12.06. <laughs> I'm very and good at Everyone else it. noticed that other than you. <laughs> you're in the gym zone. You're just making love to Measure Quick right now, and we're all over here like, hey. We're here. Brian, I ignore you on the podcast, too. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. All right, I'm almost done. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> All right. Gas heating, just so you know, that's probably one of the bigger ones we're doing in gas heating. The combustion analyzer is tied in. There's a lot of things you can do with that. We talked about a lot of this yesterday, but the gas heating test, if you haven't played with that yet, I'd highly recommend you go through that. It'll tell you a lot about the system and how that system's operating. And then the last thing we want to do is just talk about a little bit about trending. If you haven't used trending a lot, it's probably one of my favorite features for just understanding system operation. I learned more watching trends of systems than I probably learned at any time in my career with MeasureQuick by just understanding the impacts that everything has through trends. So it's something, again, I take the time and, and look at. Real quick, how often should the gauges be installed after it's commissioned? Three times, right? When the system's commissioned, when it's disposed of, and when design conditions no longer hold true. We have a whole process of checking the charged out gauges. It's called the NIST mode. And basically what it does is it replaces the needle. So we had customers call and say, oh, your guy didn't hook up the gauges to my machine and, and, uh, and, and I don't think he's doing his job right. So we built in what we call virtual gauges here. That's what these blue needles are. So it will tell you what the pressure should be relative to the load conditions. And you get everything in a non-invasive mode that you would get without measuring the pressures. So it's a very, very slick mode, and that's something you should learn to use and measure quick. And that was the end. So now you can talk. Thanks so much to Jim and MeasureQuick. If you want to find out more, go to MeasureQuick.com. Catch you on the next video. Mm -hmm.